Hello, Sam. Thank you very much for coming on this episode of the Insurance Brokers Podcast. Now, I know we worked together for quite a while now, haven't we? Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for inviting me, Sarah. Well, thank you for coming on. I think you've been a huge help to me over the, the past year, and I um, thought it'd be really uh, good to have a chat about what you're seeing in your clients, and I suppose yourself as well, for, for people like uh, my clients, people like me, uh, small to medium business owners. Yeah, it's been obviously a really interesting journey over the last seven weeks. Um, I've just come off a three hour call actually with my one of my mastermind groups. So I can give you some raw feelings and emotions of, of how um, yeah, real life is me feeling right now. And I think like many situations, it's been a roller coaster of emotions. Um, I think right at the very beginning, seven weeks ago, there was a lot of shock and fear, um, filled or joined with a little bit of excitement actually, because it was something different. Um, so there was there was some mixed emotions, but fear, anxiety, um, but a lot of excitement about how we're going to make this work. So let's adapt. We've all got to remote work if we can. Let's put it into practice and let's all pull together to make this work. So there was definitely a big sort of community spirit amongst everybody to sort of work together along with their team um, and get us through it. How have you found the switch to working from home? I've actually surprised myself because I'm very much a people person. And I think, um, again, this is interesting amongst my client friends. The, the introverts amongst them absolutely are loving this and are loving the fact that they don't have to go outside their doors, you know, not because they've got any fear of that, but just because they're really comfortable in their own skin and comfortable with their own company. Um, and are really happy to be able to, to work in their own sort of close environment. The extroverts amongst us, um, you know, myself in, in that camp, it's very much a, a people tactile, um, kinesthetic person. I'm very much missing the energy that I get from working with people on a face-to-face -face basis. So I think it depends what camp you sit in as to how it's affecting you. Some are loving it, some now are just telling me, do you know what, I, I, need, I need contact. You know, I need to be with others and they're desperate for that. I've, uh, I've found it midway between the two. Um, just the, the sheer ability to manage uh, homeschooling, business, development, clients so you're not alone there um, and many clients are struggling and I think again it depends on sort of your own situation like I said to you the, the first week of lockdown when my husband was still working um, I you know I really struggled with that because what I do is deliver one-to-one -one coaching and I'm doing that eight hours solid on zoom and to try and homeschool an eight-year-old and 15 year old and entertain especially the little one you know, we, we try to do too much. And I think that's all part of the initial excitement and adaptability and flexibility that, that was in the early days. And I think what's happened now is the reality has kicked in. We've realised we can't be great at all of those things. You know, we can't be a great business owner. We can't serve our clients the way that we love to. And we can't be a great parent. We can't do all of those things tremendously well. Um, and that's hard to accept when, when we are perfectionists. How do you... Um... So what's your advice? Because most of my clients, as you know, are, are insurance brokers. Yeah. Um, and that's a very uh, tactile, social relationship building business. Obviously, there's a lot going on in that market at the moment through various mm -hmm. claims, problems, uh, you know, renewing clients. And I've heard a couple of clients say, actually, that their uh, renewal retention has increased because businesses are not now in this stage trying to find a better insurance deal so there's there's you know positives that come out of that but where do we sit on new business because i you must have seen it play out like i have initially there was a massive swarm of people pushing hard across uh, social media for various uh new business sales offering uh the world um and there's a lot of people that were uh refuting that and saying this is not the time stop where do you think we sit with new business and what we should be doing now for that? I think that's a really good question. I think, again, it all falls into this cycle. Um, I very much agree that on weeks maybe one, two and three, 
we weren't ready to be sold to. Uh, we were still adapting, we were still flexing, we were still finding our own groove in business and settling in with remote working. And the people that panicked on early days, on day one, and just threw all sorts of online products at us, I don't believe we've been very successful at all because, as I say, we just weren't ready to buy at that stage. I now believe, week eight, that we are because we've come through the cycle now. Um, we're far more used to and adapted now to this new working and we're ready. We're ready to do business as usual. We're ready to crack on um, because we've realised we have to. You know, business doesn't stop. Um, and if we do stop, if we stop innovating and stop uh, growing and developing, then we're, we're not going to survive this pandemic and get through lockdown and come back into some sort of normality. So I think now we're ready to buy. And I think, I hope that what people have done throughout the last seven weeks is serve their audience and done that by supporting, by guiding, by educating. And hopefully then you've built some credibility, trust and loyalty. And those people will now be ready to buy your product. If I'm ready to start buying as a business, so if I'm ready to start looking for training events uh, that might support me or my staff, or I'm ready to start buying marketing from people or whatever, I'm, I'm probably not thinking about insurance. I'm probably going through the, uh, the oh my God, have I got business interruption? How do I get uh, the money from furloughing insurance probably isn't where I'm starting to buy yet. What do you think about that? Well, I have had um, conversations with clients this week actually um, talking about they've now realised they haven't got critical um, care insurance for critical workers, um, and that's something that they've put in place and they've purchased that policy only this week. So although it's not going to cover the coronavirus, they're well aware of that. But what they've realised is they're exposed. So I think something like this does make us reflect and review. Um, and most of my clients have been through a massive review process over the last seven weeks because it's the perfect time to do that. And they're having a look at where their exposure is. Um, and sometimes insurance fits that gap and plugs that gap. So I still believe there's a market and I still believe we're buying. What well, I've spoken to quite a few um, of clients and potential clients that are amazed at the working on the business rather than in the business that, that the mm -hmm. space they've had to do mm -hmm. and um and actually like you say now we're coming into whatever it is week six of lockdown um and business as normal is starting to adapt i've spoken to quite a few people who are busier than ever because instead of managing to do one meeting they're managing 15 because back-to-back -back zoom calls and things like that and I had a really interesting conversation with Clive Nathan in a previous um, podcast, and he was saying that um, he's just very, very mindful of not being sucked into emails because it's so easy to let emails dictate your work. And he's trying to keep some semblance of structure in terms of internal meetings or review groups and, and, and patterns that allow you to, to take the bigger picture. So I think there's quite a lot of sense coming out of this. One thing that I myself and I know others have struggled with uh, is motivation. So once you've got the mindset right, how do you manage the motivation? Yes, you're right. And I think, again, you know, I keep referring back to the cycle. And I think at first, the adrenaline, excitement and fear fed that motivation. Um, coming off the, the mastermind call that I had this morning, if all of them have hit the brick wall at the same time and I don't think that's any coincidence I think that again you know this the cycle that I refer to is our emotions and I think that the adrenaline is worn out um, the excitement has worn out this has now become the norm um, it takes 21 days to form a habit and we've been doing this for longer than 21 days it's now become our norm our new habit um, and now people are realizing that maybe this is not the habit that they want long term so although I think that there's been many positives, um, and one of those positives, you're absolutely right, are people are having the time to work on their business rather than just dealing with the demand of in it all of the time. And that's been a huge positive. And I've seen many strategies come out of the last six weeks to move people forward and to grow their business. Um, but mindset and motivation is certainly something that 
is becoming the key thing that are holding people back right now. So what can you do to improve your mindset and your motivation? Well, I think everyone's different um, and we all get triggered by different things. And I think we all know there are different triggers. So for many people, exercise plays a big part in that. And when we're feeling flat, um, I know for me personally, um, I love running. And um, so if I'm feeling like I need actually a little bit of perspective on things, then I'll just grab my trainers, grab my dog, go for a run and everything seems better when you get back. Um, something that I find helps with my concentration, my focus and my discipline mindset is just by giving myself one thing to do every day because otherwise overwhelm can creep in. Um, and we can't, you know, we don't have all the answers, so we can't solve all of our problems. We don't know what we don't know. And um, there's no way of finding out those answers. There are things outside of our control, which again is really hard um, for control freaks such as myself to deal with. So just taking one thing each day and being able to tick that off as a success. But that one thing for me has to be something that's really going to move my business forward. So what is the one thing that is holding you back that you know you could do to make a difference to your business? And if you tackle that one thing every day, then it's going to make you feel positive. And positivity breeds productivity, which breeds a positive mindset. I feel like there is um, there are different types of people and different types of industries have different types of mindsets. And um, whether or not you're in a, an entrepreneurial um, mindset or a more corporate mindset probably plays into this quite a lot. What do you think? I think the roles within the industry are quite key to this. Um, again, you know, I know that for salespeople that are highly driven, normally quite self-motivated, quite self-disciplined people, they normally are extroverts, again, that feed off energy from other people. So they're really struggling with this. And I'm assuming that many of your insurance clients are made up of that sort of character, the salesperson. So again, it's about knowing what your own personal triggers are, putting those into place. Um, and also, you know, it's about the leadership too. The leadership of the sales team plays a massive part in how they feel, uh, their mindset and their motivation. And you've got to be able to inspire, you've got to be able to keep morale up, which is really hard when you're remote working. And I've seen some fantastic initiatives you know, one of my clients has left Easter eggs on everybody's door. Um, they do their usual Friday night quiz with everybody. Um, but whilst they're doing it, they've got delivery, delivering pizzas all over the place. So they can all share in literally a virtual drink, food and get together just to keep everybody bonded spirits up. Um, and one-to-ones, I think one-to-ones are really key uh, right now. If you're a leader, especially within your sales team, I would keep, I would be on to them, I would be on them every single day. I, I, I like salespeople like spinning tops and the job of a leader with a salesperson is to keep that spinning. And when you do a one-to-one -one with them, you should re-energize them so it should be spinning really, really fast. And the minute that that slows down is when you need to put another one-to-one -one on and re-energize again. So leadership is key uh, to morale and motivation. How have you found... Um... I know we've talked a lot about masterminds before, and I know you run masterminds as part of um, Cloud9, and mm -hmm. uh, the mentorship mastermind program is something that we've talked about within Boston Tullis for an insurance-specific uh, mm -hmm. group. Um, how have you found that belonging to a mastermind and running masterminds has helped you? What Give me a, a sense of, of, of how that's worked for you and for your... I can honestly say that I think it's been a lifetime for many because what it's done is enable you to share your fears, anxieties, emotions, vulnerabilities and successes um, in, a, in a most genuinely safe environment where you're not being judged. Um, and that sounds like such a fluffy cliche line, but the role of Mastermind is to offer that community and is to offer a place where people 100% genuinely have your back. Um, and a lot, a lot of things in business are fake. A lot of networking, I think, is fake. Um, 
and Mastermind is the only place in 10 years I've ever experienced real, genuine, honest emotion feedback um, and, and like I say, relationship because you choose whether you, you build a relationship with people really when you spend that amount of time together. Um, masterminds are and typically over sort of 12 month period. You really get to know somebody, you know what makes them tick, you know their vulnerabilities, you know how to pick them up. So what we've been doing in my mastermind sessions is instead of having our monthly meetups, we've been having weekly two hour phone calls. So again, this is about keeping that spinning top going. So my job as a facilitator is to make sure that morale is up within my mastermind community. And by having those two hour weekly meetings, everybody sharing um, their challenges, we hold the mirror up, we make sure that everybody's moving in the right direction every single week. So there's a massive amount of accountability, a huge amount of holding the mirror up for the right reasons and genuine reasons, and the support amongst those groups has just been incredible. So I think for, for me, what this has highlighted is your support network is key to your own motivation, your own self-discipline, um, and it's certainly been a lifeline for me over the last six, seven weeks. I, uh, the mastermind is, like we've discussed before, is something that I'm really keen to learn more about. And the type of programme that we've talked about within Boston Palace of, of putting together for our, for our clients probably mirrors some of that. Uh, mm. But I uh, wish we'd done it prior to this because, um, like you say, that keeping the spinning top is sometimes quite difficult, particularly for those of us that have got an, now a dual role as, as teacher, which... There's a reason I didn't go into teaching. It's because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so. Me too. And I think also what, you know, like I said a moment ago, we don't know what we don't know. Um, and the, the beauty of Mastermind is that you've got, you've got other business owners who may know something you don't know. And to share those learnings with you, I mean, the amount of technology that I have learned in 12 months from my Mastermind peers has just been absolutely incredible. And I can honestly say that my business is probably 70% more efficient because of the new platforms that I've been learning. Um, and just that alone has been worth the mastermind fee for me, you know, because like I say, I've learned so much. How, where do you see this going? So one of the, I'll explain the question. One of the things that I think will happen to many, many businesses is that they will pivot and change their offering slightly or hugely there'll be there'll be there'll be both mm. um and i think technology will play a massive part in that in the way people work how efficient they are what they're doing and how they're doing it then nobody knows what's going to happen with covid19 nobody knows what's going to happen with the economy afterwards although the economists are having a field day and trying to guess uh what do you think is going to happen for the sme world I think there will be a period of change. There has to be. We don't go through something like this without, you know, that reflection and review um, and implementing some change. And only this morning, actually, we were splashing out from a mastermind call with an HR consultant who um, we are we will be modelling her business based around the fact that she cannot no longer sit in a client's workspace and offer that one-to-one -one HR support. Um, but actually we saw that as a positive because changing that model is going to make her and her business more efficient and more profitable. So I think for those changes, it's going to be very positive. I think everybody is going to be looking at ways um, that this has improved the efficiency of their business and also in the way that we're looking after our planning as well. I know that that's having a huge impact on people looking at it instead of driving for three hours up and down the motorway to go to a meeting, well, it can be done like this very successfully. I've got a client who's a health and safety assessor um, and all of his new assessments have been done via Zoom or another platform. Um, and he's going to continue to do it that way because again, he can maybe do 10 assessments a day rather than just one. So there's many efficiencies which are going to come out of this and many positives. However, I said before we're creatures of habit and it takes 21 days to form a habit. Um, and I do believe that some of us are, the way that we do business is so ingrained and the normality of that is so ingrained in us that it won't take long before we're back on that hamster wheel. And I think that will become a big shame for many of us. I know 
personally, um, what this has taught me is that I don't need to be in the office till 10 p.m. a couple of nights a week. Um, that's just become a habit um, because that's just what I've been doing on a Tuesday and Thursday. I've just continued to do that. This pause for me has made me realise that actually I don't need to do that. I just need to be a bit more smart with my time and more efficient with the technology that I use. I read, I've read a couple of these things, uh, which initially I jumped right on the bandwagon and then afterwards thought, actually, no, I fundamentally disagree with this. I've seen a couple of things going around social media saying things like, if you don't come out of this period with a new skill or blah, 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 foreign language, whatever it might be, then you never lacked time, you lacked discipline. So I've seen a couple of, of that type of mantra going around and initially I thought right this is my chance to do blah 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 and as obviously that uh, initial buzz wore off and you find you're actually now living it and it's not quite as exciting as you thought it might be and it's actually quite difficult I thought to myself no this is actually fundamentally wrong every single person is dealing with this in their own personal way and it brings their own personal fears or um, anxieties or problems so that your brain may not be working at its usual 100% capacity and if you find you're at 60% the pressure of then having to learn some new skill or pivot a business or start a new business or whatever it might be uh, increase your organic growth by, by 10% is absolute nonsense um, and I do think that this period is giving everybody that personal touch in business that I think has been not always there and particularly in the big corporates it, it's almost it's almost frowned upon that you have a, a personal life and a family and and actually you wake up one day and you think I really just need to go back to bed because today is not working for me everybody has those days and I I really feel that this period is bringing us closer to accepting that in a lot of environments that perhaps haven't before yeah, I think sometimes, you know, we are guilty of being on that hamster wheel. Um, and it's, you know, we just keep going and we just pedal a bit faster because actually what we're going to face when we come off and have a look is sometimes something we don't want to face. But I think in terms of setting ourselves goals, um, reinventing wheels and, you know, rewriting your business model in these, in these weeks and in this lockdown is not necessary. I think... For me, the biggest advice I've been giving to my clients is use this time to really identify where your gaps are. So for myself, um, for my business, I realized that um, lead generation was the biggest hole in my business. And it's, I've known this for a while, um, but the demands of, of the business have prevented me from tackling it in a really robust way. So I've been plugging the gaps, if you like, I've been putting the the plaster over it. Um, so what I did and I, I committed to right from day one of lockdown was this is what I'm going to tackle. This, this extra time has given me the luxury to tackle it in the robust way that I'd really like to. So I'm really pleased that just by putting one goal in a day, um, I have got some really good lead generation strategies that I'm now implementing into the business and will be live by, you know, probably the end of May. So... I'm, I'm really chuffed and proud that I, I took upon myself to identify the gap um, and I've worked towards it every single day. So I haven't added a new language to my repertoire, I haven't changed the way that I do anything, I've just recognised what I needed to feel to make my business stronger when we come out of this. And what sort of things have you been looking at doing? Well, actually, Sarah, I worked with yourself um, on implementing a 10-point business survey so, yes, um, um, and that was a terrific partnership. Um, and I'm so glad that we had that discussion during obviously one of your coaching sessions. Um, and I said, hey, thanks for doing that for me. Um, because you've done it for Boston Tunnels and I thought it was tremendous. Um, so you. that gives people the opportunity to answer 30 questions on 10, what I call fundamental key areas of business success or achieving business success. And if you're happy, Sam, I'll put the link to that in the show notes. So anybody that wants to do your 10-point business plan and find out where they're at, if you're happy, I'll do that. That would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, that would be really lovely. 
And what that did is highlight, or what it does is highlight the gaps in your business. So what I just said, it, that's what helped me um, tackle my biggest frog, if you like, um, over this lockdown period. So that's what I'm trying to help and encourage others to do. Um, but obviously for me, it's also a way of capturing uh, data for me to market to if people want that and sign up to it. So that was one of the strategies. Um, I'm also working with another business on um, writing a five day challenge of how to break through your glass ceiling. Um, typically when a business works with me, they've, they've normally plateaued or hit a glass ceiling. Uh, and I, I believe that that's my niche in, in pushing businesses through that. So I've just written or actually do, still writing um, five days of how to push through your glass ceiling, working with me on a, on a, on a five day project. So that's something else that, that I'm hoping to launch in the next two weeks. Oh, fabulous. Well, when you do, let me know and I'll add that link as well. Oh, that would be lovely. Thank you. I do. I do genuinely believe, actually, as a concept, business coaching is something that um, hasn't happened here as quickly as it has, for example, in the States. Mm -hmm. But more and more people I speak to are, are, are using business coaches. I think the problem is there are a lot of people out there that profess to be business coaches uh, that actually aren't. But I can honestly say in the However long we've been working together, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from you and I've really, um, you've given me quite a lot of courage to go forward and do certain things, think certain things. And um, so I can honestly say it's been really supportive. So thank you. Well, that's lovely. Um, my goal is to provide confidence and clarity um, in, by coaching. So that's lovely to hear that that's hit the spot there. And I think it, you know, it's huge credit to you, Sarah, as well, because Coaching works if you're ready for it and if you're open to it. Um, and the best results, obviously, are when business owner and coach work together to achieve you know, what they set out to achieve in their objectives. The role of a coach, I believe, is to nudge you um, gently out of your comfort zone and, and to ask you the questions that you wouldn't want to ask yourself and you wouldn't want to answer yourself. So that's my role and as well. Accountability, holding the mirror up and pushing you forward all the time. I think the um, insurance industry use um, have quite a lot of non-exec directors on boards, yeah. which is not dissimilar to business coaching. I think one of the things that I'm quite excited about for what we're doing or what we're putting together at the moment is kind of a cross between uh, an NED and a, and a, and a business coach um, because of the wealth of knowledge within Boston Tullis. Um, so that's one of the, the things that we're putting together at the moment, which we've had quite a bit of interest in. I think you're right. I think um, I spent 20 years in the mortgage industry and I think it's quite similar. Um, and that was a big hit there too. It was the board was full of non directs directs, um, acting at, in that coaching and mentoring role, nudging forward, asking questions that um, people that are involved in it day to day cannot see it's no different really to the to the role of the coach and it does exactly the same yeah and i think also when you are a small to medium business owner you've got fifteen thousand different hats to wear so if yeah. you're trying to plan a marketing strategy and manage your sales team and work out your hr and um do new business growth yourself and and things get lost and it's just it's just that person to hold a mirror up and then maybe support and take on some of those some of those um, external roles. So, yeah, I'm a big believer in surrounding yourself with clever people, and I think the most successful businesses do that very well. Mm. Um, they build a team around them that is going to get them the success they deserve because we can't know everything and we can't be great at everything. And when you come to something like COVID 19 and everybody's suddenly just pushed over the precipice and waiting to see where they land, it's nice to be falling with some people that you you uh, yeah, can rely absolutely. on to catch you or soften the blow. So Yeah, that's when your support network really kicks in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sam, once again, I really appreciate your, your thought and your insight. Um, I'll put the links in below and um, would just like to thank you for your, for your time. No problem. I hope it helps. So good luck to all of you out there. Um, we'll get through this together.